To Americans who complain that their election campaigns drag on for far too long, welcome to France, where here it's a sprint, not a marathon. Politicians have 12 short days to convince and snap legislative elections that uh, could redraw the political landscape, both for France and for Europe. Uh, it's only been a week since a far-right surge in European elections sparked Emmanuel Macron's shock decision to dissolve parliament, with the country, you could say, split in three between a hastily concluded alliance of the left, the centre-right under Macron, and Marine Le Pen's national rally, we'll ask which way the pendulum is about to swing and whether calls for a Republican front against the far right still resonate in the year 2024, even when they come from stars of the national football squad, say. France's president has been roundly criticized for taking too great a leap into the unknown with his clear-the-air strategy of sending citizens back to the polls so soon. The question now is whether those voters are also willing to take a gamble and flirt with the rollback of the Republic's universal values and go for a far-right party. Today in the France 24 debate, France's mad dash to snap elections. With us, she thought she was done with campaign coverage a week ago Sunday. France 24 is uh, Claire Pacana. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, Victor Goury Lafont, politics reporter for Politico Europe. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, welcome as well to Gabriel Latanzio, associate professor of uh, American civilization at uh, Panthéon, Paris 1 Panthéon Sorbonne University. How are Thanks. you? Thanks. Good to be here. I'm good. Great. Good to see you as well. Attorney and commentator Laurent Cohen Tanigui, you are the author of, uh, in French, of uh, Resistances, Dem Democracy Put to the Test. Is that how you translate it roughly? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Uh, your reactions, by the way, on the hashtag F24 debate. All the drama of a long campaign packed into 12 days means that every 24-hour cycle is hard to condense into uh, just three minutes. But have no fear, Caitlin Kelly is here. With two weeks to go, the candidates for the French snap election are now official. After a dramatic week in French politics, the campaign now begins for the 577 seats in the National Assembly. A first series of opinion polls have projected a possible win for the far-right national rally. Riding off a victory in the EU parliamentary elections, leader Jordan Bardella was already speaking in the future tense. Emmanuel Macron, maybe you agree with me on this, has made a choice since 2017 to consider his prime ministers as partners. I will not be the partner of the president. If the French people give me their trust, I will drive the nation's policies through very clear proposals, through concrete priorities, purchasing power, security, immigration. And yes, I wish to build a government of national union. Following Macron's dissolution of the National Assembly last Sunday, the makeup of France's political alliances continues to evolve. On the left, the new Popular Front coalition formed, taking in socialists, including former president François Hollande, and hard-left firebrands. The grouping faced its first crisis after some prominent outgoing MPs from the hard-left, France Unbowed, were not selected as candidates, allegedly due to their opposition to leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Meanwhile, Mélenchon's right-hand man, Adrien Quatennens, withdrew his candidacy amidst fears that his conviction of spousal assault would tarnish the left. I don't want my candidacy to be used to harm France unbowed and the new popular front anymore. At a time when all energy must be mobilised to defeat the far right and win, in its place, a government that will change life as so many French people impatiently expect. On the right, the decision of the Republicans' leader, Eric Ciotti, to seek an election pact with the national rally provoked internal divisions, resulting in a Republican candidate running against him in his own constituency. The Ciotti-backed Republicans, supported by the far right, will have 62 candidates, whilst the original party will enter the campaign with nearly 400. All over France, I see underground alliances between those with the illusion of grandeur under the authority of Macron's closest advisors. They are making deals they are hiding from the French people. We are discovering in many constituencies that there is no one standing against my internal opponents. After last week's seismic decision, Macron returns to domestic campaigning following the G7 and the Ukraine peace summit. But the president was advised by colleagues to let more popular figure, Prime Minister Gabriel Attal, take the lead, as the ruling Renaissance-led coalition still hope for victory.
Donc je dis une seule chose. So I'll say only one thing. Let's fight. Let's fight from the morning. Let's fight in the afternoon. Let's fight through the night. Let's fight everywhere in the country. Let's fight because we can win this parliamentary election. Victory is possible. Dig deep inside. A fortnight of frenetic campaigning begins, set to rewrite France's political landscape. Victor Gorilla, we're still asking the same question we asked a week ago at this time. Why such a short campaign? It's a short campaign because as the constitutional uh, plans for one snap elections are triggered, there's only three weeks left before the actual vote for these legislative elections take place. This might have been part of Emmanuel Macron's strategy when he decided to call snap elections to leave as little time as possible to his oppositions to organize. But there was, uh, when you had the presidential election back mm -hmm. in uh, April of 2022, it was like nearly six weeks before legislative elections uh, took place then. Absolutely. That's just a matter of how the Constitution is written. Once uh, the National Assembly is dissolved, uh, the elections take place three weeks later. After a presidential election, the electoral calendar is a little different. Uh, and since 2002, we've had the legislative elections a few weeks, basically, yeah, roughly two months after the presidential. Now that that Sunday 6 p.m. deadline for submitting candidacies has passed, are things playing out the way you expected them? I think things aren't playing out the way Emmanuel Macron expected them. And I think definitely for even for a lot of us uh, observers, it has been surprising to see that the left, which, uh, you know, was extremely divided during the European campaign, has been able to forge a new coalition so quickly. I think this was definitely not in the president's plan, who was kind of betting on the fact that the left would once more run divided and uh, not be in a position to make the runoffs in a lot of constituencies. Uh, and to that extent, uh, his gamble seems to have backfired a little bit. Uh, and now what remains to be seen is to, in what capacity he's able to make up for that uh, in the next few weeks. We're going to get to, to, to that point of how the left uh, is doing in that uh, uh, rally, trying to rally together uh, and bring in uh, disparate uh, and sometimes rival forces under one banner. First, though, there's the talk, and this is, I know, something you're working on, Claire Pacalin, when you think back to previous uh, seismic shocks in French politics. Back in 2002, there was the shock of Marine Le Pen's father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, qualifying for the second round of a presidential election. No one from the far right had uh, done so since uh, Nazi occupation. It sparked a moment of outrage and national unity. Uh, the, that call to arms uh, was carried, as we saw in that report, by weekend demonstrations and also by petitions penned by famed artists and athletes, including the captain of the French national football team, that this Monday opens its European Championships campaign against Austria. I'd like to address all the French people, especially the younger generation. We are a generation that can make a difference. Today, it's clear that the extremes are on the doorstep of power. We have the opportunity to choose the future of our country. And that's why I'm calling on all young people to go out and vote, to really realize the importance of the situation. We need to identify with values of diversity, tolerance and respect. Gabriela Tansio, is that a message that will resonate and get young people to the, <laughs> to the polls to vote against the far right? Maybe, maybe. Maybe if he scores tonight, it will be all the more powerful. I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much people are looking for an enthusiastic answer to the situation. My, my, my impression, it's true of young people as well, is that I've never seen so many people vote against and so few vote for. Uh, this is something you can just uh, make sense of by looking at the number of people who are taking part in actual you know, partisan politics. It's never been so few. So, uh, so how effective is that message by Kylian Mbappe? God, I, I, I wish I knew. I mean, in my opinion, it's necessary for sure. Um, but it's, I, I don't think anyone holds a position where they can just push a button and motivate political participation. The truth is many young people do not vote and I don't expect it to, to, to change much. And, and more and more of them actually vote for the far right, which is very concerning, in my opinion. Laurent cohen when you compare to the past and, uh, you know, this talk of a Republican front that uh, you in the second because it's a two round system in France, second round, you hold your nose and you vote for whichever candidate is against the far right. Yeah, I, is that going to happen this time or not? I think it will happen probably less than it did in the past because the far right has shown a sort of more uh, moderate appearance. Uh, but I think it will happen again. Certainly the <clears throat> coalition on the left is is running on that. Um, 
you know, on that fear. And uh, I think the, the participation, the turnout, at least the poll right now, mm. uh, announced a much higher turnout than, uh, than in 2022, for example. Mm. We're already, I think, at 62% projected. So I think there will be a, a strong participation. And, that, and that's very important in order to prevent, on the second round, a face-to-face -face between the two extremes. It's very important there'll be what's called a triangulaire, like a third candidate. Uh, to give a choice to <clears throat> those voters who dislike both the extreme Yeah, just, right to, just to, explain, extreme to explain for our viewers, there's a yeah. quirk in the French system, correct me if I'm wrong, where if you garner 12.5% of all the registered voters, you can go to the second round. So in some cases, the runoff won't be between two candidates, but three and possibly even four. Right, exactly. And, and that's extremely important so that, as I said, uh, <clears throat> voters who don't want either neither the extreme right or the extreme left to, to seize power, but then they can vote for, for a third candidate. Why is it that Emmanuel Macron's party didn't feel there's 577 constituencies that they, he didn't have 577 candidates? Why? Well, because they are, you know, they, you have to look uh, <coughs> consistency by consistency, and there are uh, some of them where there is no chance that they would win or that they would want to sort of, uh, you know, give a, a chance to some allied or, you know, potentially allied uh, to, uh, to be elected. Claire Pacalin, when you think back, you were uh, at uh, Macron's uh, campaign headquarters on the night of the European elections, which seems like a million years ago, but it's only eight days ago. Uh, is, is it because, uh, uh, for tactical reasons, that there's not 577 candidates from his camp, or just that there's so much disarray that... In some instances, they didn't. Well, I can tell you about the, the shock, forward. obviously, at, at Valérie Ayer's um, electoral party. So Valérie Ayer was, was the woman heading the list in for Emmanuel Macron's party in the European elections a week ago. Yeah, there was a huge amount of shock in the room. Um, I spoke to a parliamentary assistant for a Renaissance uh, member of parliament, so Renaissance, of course, Emmanuel Macron's party. And she said to me, I've just lost my job. She's, she was clearly, and there were many like her, and the next day, packing up her boxes, packing up the office and getting out on the campaign trail. And that's what she's doing now. So there was certainly a lot of shock in terms of preparation time. There were people in the room that night at Valérie Ayer's electoral evening saying, what's going on? We're not convinced this is the right idea. This is a huge gamble. This is a huge risk. In terms of why there are about 60 seats um, or constituencies where Emmanuel Macron's party or his sort of group of parties now, this coalition which is called Together for the Republic, there are about 60 constituencies where they haven't put forward a candidate. Now, they're saying, and Gabrielle Attal is saying earlier on in the radio today, saying we need our candidates to be useful. And if we think that the candidate or potential candidate in that constituency doesn't have a hope in hell of beating either one of the extremes, as he calls the, the, the left-wing coalition and the far right, well, then we're just not going to field a candidate and we will support whoever is someone that we deem moderate and Republican who could beat one of the, the, ex the extremes. Gabriel Atanzio, uh, your thoughts on this? And also, uh, getting back to it, you know, how the, f the, the far right is reacting to this idea of trying to reconstitute a, uh, uh, a, a re what they call a Republican front and anything but the far right, right. Uh, uh, movement, incumbent national rally member of parliament, Julien Odoul. I'll quote with you, to you what he said. He denounced a petition by artists who he claims, quote, many of whom live abroad, do not pay their taxes in France and allow themselves to give lessons in democracy to the same French people they look down upon. Sure. Uh, fair game. Uh, no, I, I think we should be careful with the, the names we give to these coalitions. Uh, I, I've been voting for a bit more than 20 years now. Uh, I've always voted left wing. Uh, actually, no, uh, there was Chirac and there was Macron twice. And I remember in 2017 and 2022, as a you know, left wing voter, I found myself voting for the centrist who said, hey, how about you're reasonable and you know, participated in the, in the fight against the, the, the National Front. I'm not part of an extremist group. I, I don't think I am. And I do think the majority of the left-wing coalition, and I think that's important, is not in any way comparable to those who have a tragic history dating back to the 40s in France. So I, I, I think the situation is not so grim. It's actually, you know, pretty, pretty bad. But I wouldn't say that the forces in the left are 
anti-liberal politically. We believe in human rights, in individual rights, etc., and so on. And this is also what we will be fighting for. I believe that Julien Odoul and a number of them actually do not believe much in the Republic. It's a word that they hated until 10 years ago. They've spent decades, for as long as we can remember, saying that the Republic was a... Mm, should I say it? A whore. That's the word they used. And they said they were in favor of the nation, not the republic. They've lied. They're lying now. They will keep lying and we'll do our best to beat them. Uh, the uh, French YouTuber Squeezy posting an open letter to France's youth on Instagram to his 8.8 .8 million followers, clearly uh, calling to vote uh, against uh, the far right. These kinds of calls, uh, let me put it to you, Victor Gori Lafont, do they uh, weaken the far right or strength or bolster it us versus them making them energizing them more I think it's a complicated question because obviously someone like Squeezy or a lot of these influencers uh, internet figures aren't particularly divisive so you know one could probably think it would hurt the far right more than anything or at least contribute to mobilizing young voters uh, if you look at polling right now there's about 51 percent of young voters who are getting uh, ready to go vote uh, on June 30th, that's a lot more than in the European election, but there's still the segment of the population uh, which is voting the less. Uh, what's interesting also to note is that if you look at who these young people are looking to vote for, on the one hand, you still have an overrepresentation of the left. Young people tend to uh, veer towards the left a little more than the general population. But on the other hand, the far right has never been at such a high level within young voters. So there's definitely been a little bit of an evolution. We can see that young people don't necessarily exist within a vacuum, and they also follow trends which exist more broadly across society. Across society and across Europe. With, with uh, Politico's Nicholas Vinegar, you, uh, you penned a piece on why young people are turning more and more to the far right. So what's true for France is true for the rest of Europe? Yeah, absolutely. We've noticed um, this kind of trend in a lot of different countries, including, for example, uh, Germany, where the far right also uh, scored kind of a historical uh, performance. Um, so this is definitely a continental trend, uh, and it can be explained by different factors, uh, which can sometimes change from country to country. We know that in certain countries like the Netherlands, uh, there was a lot of issues around housing. Uh, there's a lot of issues also around uh, student uh, poverty, or at least uh, st di financial difficulties that some students might be having. Uh, but in France, you know, if you speak to analysts, this is still very much related to immigration and the fact that there is a more significant part of the French youth now, uh, which is, you know, opposed to immigration, which mm -hmm. links questions of immigration with uh, security concerns and uh, is therefore kind of edging towards the far right uh, in, you know, much greater proportions than they uh, used to. Laurent cohen Tanuyi, this... Replacement theory that, uh, you know, immigrants are coming in and replacing the, 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 those that are born here for generations and generations, uh, that, that this resonates among young people? Well, it seems to, if I, if I read uh, <laughs> my colleague's article, it seems to be, uh, immigration seems to be a theme that resonates with young people, that uh, uh, foreigners are out taking their jobs. I mean, there's clearly a, a social malaise and, uh, and that may resonate, but I'd like to I return to uh, to your point. I, 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 uh, I'm not saying that sure. uh, I'm not putting the uh, the far right and the uh, the left uh, alliance on the same footing, except maybe for their economic program, which are <coughs> equal, equally disastrous for France. But uh, of course, there, there, but there's also uh, LFI in that coalition, and and uh, yeah, the France Unbowed Party, which has been kind of a uh, at the heart of, uh, how should you say it, it's been polarizing. For that, we can cross now to France 24's uh, James Andre. Uh, the official campaign period kicking off with a unity rally uh, of the left-wing parties that includes the LFI, uh, the uh, France Unbowed Party, uh, just mentioned there uh, by uh, Laurent cohen Tanuyi. And uh, I guess the mission for this rally is to prove Emmanuel Macron wrong, that uh, uh, it isn't him or the extremes, the left being the same as the far right. Yeah, very much so. I mean, the, the main message here is uh, that, you know, there is a large part of the civil society, all those who are on the left, from moderate left to more extreme left, if you will, that are present here backing uh, this new coalition, this, uh, uh, this uh, new popular front. And actually, right now, it's Bernard Thibault who is speaking here on the stand. Bernard Thibault, who is former leader of uh, the CGT uh, union here in France. Uh, his 
successor who is now leading the party. The, the, the union was here just a few minutes ago, but there are economists, there are members, you know, people working in universities, teachers, etc., who are here taking this stand, showing support for uh, this new left-wing alliance. It is very broad indeed, and uh, the, the, the message is very clearly, for example, Earlier on, we were talking to Julia Cagé. Julia Cagé is an economist. She was telling us, you know, the government is trying to sell the same old story, that it's either us talking about Emmanuel Macron's camp, of course, or the extremes, extreme left, extreme right. Well, she said, rather, I'm an economist. I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, the economy and what this uh, popular front program will do to the economy, I can tell you about it, and I can tell you it's credible. You know, this is very much the message that all these people who are mobilizing today have come uh, to carry, and also to show support Someone was taking this stand earlier on saying, you know, you must use your phones, you must campaign, you must try and convince people around you. So this is very much the message here. It says that we are here, we are together, we stand united. As you know, there have been many uh, criticisms over the weekend, many discussions of how uh, this big left-wing bloc is in fact much more fragmented than it appears, which is true in politics. There are very large differences between, for example, what the Socialist Party or France and Bau believes on some uh, files. But the idea is to show, yes, we must stand united in the face of the National Front. James Andre, many thanks for uh, joining us live there at that uh, unity rally taking place in the eastern Paris suburb of uh, Montreuil. Are you reassured, Laurent Cohen-Tanugui, there, that uh, when you hear economists, uh, left-wing economists like Julia Cagé says, yes, we do have a plan. Not, not, not really. I, I, I know Julia Cagé was once my student and she's always been pretty <laughs> radical. But no, I'm not. In fact, I, I really think that... Uh, LFE's behavior uh, in the past few years and months, uh, including at the National Assembly with raising the Palestinian flag and all the chaos on the thing, has really helped the national rally. They're helping the far right to, <coughs> to win, and that's, that's very dangerous. Well, the, the first way to help the far right is to call these elections when you know that they have a strong chance to win. Yeah, yeah. And, and this decision I'm might not, not be just... I'm not know. defending no, no, the of course, decision I'm at sure all. I'm sure we will but, agree on but, quite a few but, things, actually. Uh, yeah. No, one thing that comes to mind immediately is that the French right, for as long as we can remember, 200 years, has been divided as well. You have three main traditions. You have conservatives that now are closer to nationalists. You have, uh, let's say, the pro-business side. It had different names, but that's still a reality. And you had Christian Democrats. And, and these three families, some way, somehow, I've always found, you know, a providential figure to be able to go forward and, you know, and, and, and change France in a way. Uh, f you know, as far as the left, uh, sure, myself, I I'm waiting for something new. You know, we, we've had a number of families, we used to say the new left, the old left, you know, the environmentalist, the Stalinist, the socialist, etc., and so on. Uh, I think it's a time also of just uh, uh, profound change. We would be wrong to think that this is just a picture, it's a movie. And I do think that we're talking about a moment in French history which is very fascinating. It's like a TV show. But the next few years are going to be critical and crucial. And I do think that eventually there will be new forces in French politics that will not rely so much just on one figure finding a way to unite us all. Well, there are still the old timers st around. Two former presidents weighing in in the last days. Conservative Nicolas Sarkozy, who has at times been an advisor to Macron. He told a Sunday newspaper why it was wrong to dissolve Parliament. Sarkozy's successor, François Hollande, a socialist, going one better, actually announcing he was running for Parliament in his old constituency of Toul in the centre of France. Light, running for his old seat in Parliament. I took this decision because the situation has never been so serious in our country. The threat of the far right has never been so tangible. Uh, are you happy or sad to see François Hollande? François Hollande? Oh, I don't want him and I don't want Mélenchon. That's, that's just the truth. And I, and I think I speak for a majority of French left-wingers. Uh, I mean, that's... I mean, who knows? But my impression is that, yeah, no, we, we want something new, for sure. Victor Gouri-Lafon, were you surprised to see François Hollande I was running for surprised. parliament? There have been talks of him kind of staging a comeback into French politics for a while, but it wasn't necessarily expected that he would be doing and it. And why are the centrists not running a candidate against him? Uh, officially, because, you know, their argument was to say that it wouldn't be effective, that there wasn't a path to victory in that uh, writing specifically. Uh, from what I've understood, they'll be backing the uh, LR conservative candidate against François Hollande. Really? Um, it, it's, you know, when, when they announced the decision to have snap elections, they initially kind of tried to 
uh, you know, extend an olive branch to moderate forces left and right uh, with the hope of kind of building a broader coalition than the one they currently had in parliament. Uh, that obviously backfired because the left reached its own deal on its uh, own side. And François Hollande's candidacy, what it translates, I think, is the fact that this time around, probably even more so than in 2022 when there was the first left-wing alliance, everyone on the left seems to be more or less on board. There seems to be less voices calling against an alliance. Um, so this, again, could spell trouble for Emmanuel Macron and the vote. Uh, it, it always seems a little bit brittle. Uh, uh, Claire Pacanin, you, you, you heard earlier uh, Laurent Cohen Tanugui talking about how uh, one of those divisions is, uh, is over uh, the question of uh, the war in Gaza. Uh, and uh, we saw, even as they were uh, fleshing out uh, their coalition pact, there were uh, pro Palestinian and pro Israeli demonstrators outside. Uh, that had to be separated by riot police while they were inside the building at the Green Party headquarters last week. Sure, I think there are divisions here on a political level, but there is also a lot of emotion here um, and emotions riding high. There are a lot of young people who feel engaged, invested. They want to get their voice heard, but there are big, 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 big mix. Um, from one hand, you know, the war in Gaza is such a big issue that's been going on for months now. We still don't know where we're going with it. And we have young people, when we saw those sit-ins at universities recently as well, people are engaged and people want something out of their politicians on it. But when it comes down to it, this, this new left-wing coalition, you know, they, their priority, I understand, was to just get it going as quickly as possible. What, they've got two weeks? They had to agree on something. And yeah, they don't agree on everything. But if they tried to really agree on every single point, we would still be hearing them negotiating. They would still be staying up all night in their headquarters and there would be no left wing that French voters who want to vote left wing could actually vote for. So I, I assume, and the conversations that I've had with those who were inside the negotiations was like, priority, get this thing signed. United front, let's move forward. We can't agree on everything. Of course, we've seen what happened with the left wing alliance that we saw in Nubes in the last couple of years. It didn't work out. It crumbled. But right now, the urgency is priority. Let's put on a united front and let's give the French people an option to vote left wing if they want to. Of course, the argument is perhaps some of it is very extreme, but that'll be up, up to voters to decide. Laurent cohen -Tanuyi. No, I, I agree. I think the priority uh, was to prevent uh, the national rally to seize power. And that's really the, <clears throat> the, the first priority. And therefore, the, that's the justification for this coalition, even though there are a lot of disagreements within it. And I think François Hollande, uh, you know, understood that and maybe he thought also that... Uh, this is a guy who, by the way, just for our viewers, yeah. he was at one point at 4% popularity in the mm -hmm. opinion polls when he was but, president. But he's supposed to be more popular today, according to the polls. I, I don't know. Just but, not meant to be president then. Right. But in any event, uh, I think uh, maybe he's, he's uh, joining the group, which sort of somehow balanced the extreme left on the other side, Mélenchon, and would help people who really uh, are uncomfortable with that left coalition, but would not, certainly not vote for the, for the far right to, to vote for it because there's more of a social democratic uh, poll on it. I now, think you, heard Gabriel, you heard Gabriel Attenzio talking about how the, the, wanting something new. The, yeah. Where the but, national rally is effective is there's something new is a 28 year old candidate for prime minister. Well, yeah. I don't think that youth is necessarily. <laughs> good. I wanted I think to add, I think something yeah. that does unite the left, yeah. wherever they are on the spectrum, is this strong dislike for Emmanuel Macron. I think they can all agree on that. Right. And it, that is something that they can they had to unite. Otherwise, there wouldn't be an alternative to vote. Explain that to us, because when Emmanuel Macron goes to Germany for a state visit, he's popular. When he goes to the United States and gives a speech before Congress, he's popular. Why is that that here he's not? I've got several theories, Francois. It's interesting. Um, I think it's fair to say that some of the the work and some of the successes that Emmanuel Macron and his government has had, lowering unemployment, getting the country through the COVID crisis, large and small businesses managing to stay afloat. He's really struggled and his government has really struggled to get the successes, the message of the successes through. I think a lot of French people just don't hear them. And when I look back now, I think back to the 2017 election when Emmanuel Macron obviously won that. He had only launched his own political party a year before. A few weeks later, he got a huge majority in the National Assembly. And then I remember something strange happened, whereby he had this new party 
en marche, as it was known then, it's now a renaissance. And the sort of the top talent from the party were taken and put in jobs in the Elysee. And a lot of the people who then started to run the party were either new or more junior. At, right at the moment when they needed to sign or draw up their statutes, so the internal rules that govern the party, and how they really had to make this sort of campaign machine that got a Macron elected, they had to make it into a party. And all of a sudden, there was no one really around to do that. And there were disagreements and people who had been involved in the campaign were unhappy about the direction it was going. And I think the error mm. was they never managed to get local footholds across France. Sure. You know, you look this to the Socialist Party, you look this to the, the Republicans Party on the right, to the far right as well. They have footholds across France. They have people who are ready to go out and hand out leaflets and to go to the market and try and convince people door to door knocking. Emmanuel Macron's party, from what I've understood and from the work I've been doing in the last few years, this machine, this campaign machine, which was so successful in 2017, failed to really become an effective local grassroots party. Too much That's about, my analysis. Too much about one man, Laurent cohen -Tanigui. Yes, uh, I, I agree. I agree with that. But I would add something else. Um, first of all, centrism has always been a difficult proposition in France. I mean, that what's happening now really reminds me of the Giscard year. Giscard, Giscard d'Estaing also tried to have a centrist, uh, you know, coalition. This was in the 1970s. 1970s, and the, the sort of dislike of Macron very much reminded me of the dislike of, of Giscard back then. Another, another historical thing is that, remember 2016, there was, you know, populism won in England with Brexit, uh, in the United States with Trump, and France escaped that just by the miracle of Macron's candidacy. But the, 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 the extreme forces were already there, and so thanks to the French electoral system, we avoided that, but now it's catching up on us. But there's still a chance to, to try to <clears throat> defeat that still. We're talking, it seems, Victor Gorillafon, about Emmanuel Macron's legacy in this conversation. And his original, when Claire was describing, was he said he'd take the best of the left, the best of the right, when he ran in 2017 as a political novice, never had run for any office before. Uh, has he destroyed the left and the right? Has, or were they just in hibernation? What, what's happened to the old Big Ten parties? Well, we're seeing now that there is a weakened left, but the left still exists to the capacity that they're able to run uh, an alliance. And the right has been weakened uh, largely because Emmanuel Macron has probably governed a little more to the right than what was initially expected from him when he was elected in 2017. Uh, so now the opposition force we see on Emmanuel Macron's right is uh, the far right. I think just to circle back to uh, why there's this discontent about Emmanuel Macron, I think we also can't completely rule out, you know, the policy disagreements that there might be within the population. Uh, let's remember that, you know, it was just a year ago when you had millions of people out in the street uh, to protest against uh, Emmanuel Macron's pension reform, uh, which, you know, despite the fact that it was extremely unpopular within the French population, he ended up uh, passing through a little forcibly using uh, constitutional mechanisms to bypass parliament. Uh, so I think we also need to take into consideration some disagreements which uh, large parts of the population might have with the president in terms of policy and also in terms of his methods of governing, uh, which can sometimes be maybe a little bit centered around himself and uh, a little bit uh, forceful. Is he serious, for instance, when his prime minister says that on July 1st, so the day after the first round, he's going to, by decree, impose a reform of uh, unemployment insurance? I think that's a, you know, a great example, which has even kind of, uh, you know, led to some confusion within his own camp because a lot of his, you know, including someone like Roland Escure, who's act currently one of his ministers, uh, said that he would have rather this be postponed to later. It just seems like a, you know, a poor tactical decision uh, to say that you're going to uh, impose a, um, a reform which is unpopular or at the very least divisive uh, during an electoral campaign. So that is a, a prime example of maybe something in his method of governance, which uh, has led to some disconnection with uh, parts of the French population. So after the Macron years, if I understand you correctly, it'll be a return to what was before? It could be, or it could be the accession of the far right to power. There's always a risk when you kind of, you know, blow up the traditional parties and set up a new division between yourself and the far right. At some point, the population opts for the opposition, and in this case, it might be the Did right. Emmanuel Macron postpone the inevitable? 
Or did he precipitate it, Gabriel Latanzi? The comeback of the left-right divide? No, the uh, rise of the far right. The right of the far right, he certainly helped it. I mean, this, I feel like this conversation is one that everyone's having all over Europe or even the world, saying that with neoliberal policies, eventually down the road, people will look for racial solidarity in the face of hardship. This is what happened in 2016 in, in, in the US. This is what happened maybe in a number of other places. Uh, that analysis deserves a little bit more, you know, attention of attention, of course. But there are some people who are suffering, and they are looking for, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a narrative that makes them believe that their days might be better. M my impression is that uh, you can explain the rise of the far right by both the weaknesses of the center and the weaknesses of the left. The the, the truth is, uh, the left, you know, rested its case on the idea that we could be in solidarity with one another because of a work experience. Who's talking about work? today. No one is. Uh, it's all about identity politics and a number of other issues. Quite a few people, uh, you know, in French leftist circles argue that we should go back to have a more class-centric approach. That's my belief as well. Uh, now that is also to say that we should say that there's so much to care for in France and we should not be ashamed of, of liking our country. France is first and foremost a beautiful idea that we need to be, uh, you know, to make sure that we protect it and improve it always and always. That's what, you know, progressives and socialists have always done. That's what we should do for sure. Sandwiched between the two rounds of the legislative elections uh, here in France is July 4th, which, as everyone knows, is Election Day in the UK. Uh, uh, the pendulum there slated to swing away from the nativist right to Labour. Uh, uh, the Labour on the brink of power for the first time in uh, 14 years. The Brits like to go against the grain, Claire Pekin. And why are they opting for the most moderate of uh, leaders? You know, I'd hoped to cover these elections in the UK, but because of the snap election, <laughs> I'd hope to go home, see some friends and family and do some really interesting work in the UK because it's absolutely fascinating what's happening at the moment. Obviously, I think a lot of it comes down to complete, you know, chaos within the Conservative Party. I mean, we've had three prime ministers since Boris Johnson, and then we had that tiny little moment of Liz Truss before that we had Theresa May. It's been chaotic, to say the very least. And now that Boris Johnson is, for the moment, out of the picture, it looks very much like some of those seats in the north of England, which in the past would never have voted Conservative, but which did, because people kind of like the idea of Boris Johnson and they definitely liked his campaign slogan of get Brexit done, because I can tell you, you know, between 2016 and 2019, when it was just... Oh, on and on and on, and every, everyone was talking about Brexit and it wasn't happening. Boris Johnson was someone who managed to get some of those northern voters to vote for him. This time round, Rishi Sunak, it's not looking good for so him. So the question then is, if the pendulum is swinging in the UK towards moderation, what? Are, is, is the UK vaccinated against this, what the critics might call Little Britain attitude, that, uh, that there's a lesson to be learned here in France somehow, that uh, uh, if, you, if you go for Brexit, if you go for uh, uh, cutting ties with, uh, uh, at the supranational level, that uh, it, come back to, it comes back to bite you? I don't know if the Brits are looking that much outside of their own island, to be quite honest with you. Brexit's happened. Whether you voted for it or against it, a lot of British people accept it now. And some of the repercussions, which were more negative, are be becoming clearer, but it's, it's accepted now in the UK. And a lot of people in the UK, I would say, aren't, yeah, they're, they're watching what's happening in France, they're interested. Yeah, the European elections, probably not so much. I don't know that that's the reason. I think it's really more about internal politics. And of course, the icing on the cake last week, when Rishi Sunak left the D-Day celebrations early to go back home and do a, a television interview. I mean, it, it's, I think it's more of an internal matter. That, that's All right, what so I, perhaps the end of an era over in the UK. Laurent it shifts Co every 15 years, Laurent, say, in the Laurent, UK. Laurent uh, Cohen-Tanugui, uh, is, is it the end of an era in France? Are, are we headed towards an experiment like Britain went for an experiment in 2016? Well, I, I hope not. I think UK politics has been chaos since Brexit. And I, I, mean, I, I, I arguably you could say the US, by the way, with Donald Trump in 2016 was an experiment. Right. But politics is a lot about pendulum swings. But I do hope and I, you know, I, I believe that uh, the French people will have common sense of not <laughs> going the way that, 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 that the Brits went with Brexit and uh, look at the, at the programs and what's, what's good for France. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm hopeful there'll be more French uh, bon sens, common sense uh, in this election. 
Victor Goury Lafont, again, I go back to uh, the research you've been doing across Europe, the, the, these divides, uh, because what was the narrative was that it was, again, the, uh, it was older people who were going to be, uh, were going to have a more nativist reaction to uh, the upheavals of, of changing times. And you're saying, no, it's younger people and younger people from various social strata. Absolutely. There still is a social aspect to all this. Obviously, we noticed that uh, younger people from outside big cities, younger people who uh, often uh, did not go to college, uh, those younger people might be, uh, you know, more susceptible to uh, lean towards the far right. But it is still a, a, a definitely an evolution which, you know, affects all young people, um, most significantly that they are voting a lot more for the far right than their parents might have. Uh, what's interesting, if you look at the French case, which might seem a little counterintuitive because Emmanuel Macron was the youngest president uh, in French in the French Fifth Republic. Gabriel Attal is the youngest prime minister in the French Fifth Republic. Uh, but Emmanuel Macron's strongest voter base is among people who are aged 70 and above. And even in the presidential election, if you only counted votes of people who were aged under 60, uh, Emmanuel Macron would have finished third and been eliminated uh, from the second round. Uh, so there is kind of these in, this inherent contradiction between the fact that we have this young leader who in 2017 kind of ran on breaking the system, uh, who now mostly appeals to uh, more retirees and people who might want a little more stability in France. And is the electorate more fickle than it used to be? After all, in 2019, obviously it was before COVID and it was before the, the war, the Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But back then, uh, you had a big surge of the Green Party. Mm. That is interesting. There's there's definitely a lot of evolutions within the left. Uh, we can see that the base of people who vote for left-wing parties has been essentially stable since 2019, around a third of the electorate. But who they vote for has changed a lot. In 2019, the main candidate was the Green Party candidate, Yannick Jadot. In 2022, a lot of left-wing voters, included Social Democrats, opted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon just to have a shot at making the runoff. And this time around, it was a little more balanced. The Social Democratic Candidate uh, Rafael Glucksmann finished first among the left-wing candidacies. We also saw France Unbowed improving on their 2019 score. So there's a, a, a chunk of the population which constantly votes to the left, but how they vote, which candidates they opt for, that can change greatly from one election to the other. Yeah, I think, I, speaking of Yannick Jadot, so the Green candidate from two years ago, I think he summarized it perfectly. Uh, I didn't vote for him, but he said, if the left is, is to go anywhere, it has to be more social than the Socialist Party's policies have been. It has to be more in favor of the nuclear energy than the Greens have accepted it to, you know, for, 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 for a while now. And they have to be more democratic than France Unbowed. And, and I do think that's, if there is such a thing as common sense for the youth, definitely. Because I, I happen to spend quite a bit of time with young people who study uh, science, physics, et cetera, and so on. The green stance on nuclear energy, they just cannot accept it. They are very much pro-science and, yeah. Are we going to have a lot of surprises between now and July 7th when the second round takes place? Or are things crystallizing? For the left? I mean, we're going or to fight and vote general. together. We're, we're, we're going to fight and vote together for sure. And, and have you got an idea of who's going to finish tops? Oh, what, God, who's going to control the next parliament? I wouldn't bet. I, I certainly would not. I, no. I'm guessing the far right. But, I, but if, if OK, gun to the head, I would say the far right wins the election relatively. But it's they don't have enough allies to have any sort of government. And I would expect the executive to take over in some way and find another way to actually get things going. I, I, I suspect it's not even going to be like a relative majority. We're going to be far from getting anything done in, in, in power. Hung Parliament, that's the most likely outcome, Laurent Cointenuy? Well, that's uh, certainly the worst case scenario would be, a, would be an, uh, an absolute majority for uh, either the, the, the right or, or the left. I think the best case scenario in this very difficult situation would be something like a, uh, one third, one third, one third. I mean, uh, which but is so, what we have currently or had. Which we have currently, and uh, then some coalitions uh, for some fundamental principle. You know, what are the key issues. It's, you know, Europe, uh, support for Ukraine, uh, fiscal responsibility. These are the things that should unite, uh, and democratic values. All those things should unite a bloc uh, to govern. Victor Gouridafon, have voters made up their mind or not at all with those 12 days to go? That's the big question, right? I mean, people voted less than a week ago in France. So now the question is, will they change their minds within such a small period of time? It's possible, but if you look at polling, there is a little bit of consistency. Uh, you know, the total of the left-wing vote was around 31% in the European election. Uh, they're currently polling at like 28%. Emmanuel Macron's camp uh, got 15% of the vote in the EU election. Now they're polling around 19 So it does seem like 
things are somewhat stable in terms of voting intentions. Obviously, the stakes are very high. That can push people to change their mind. But, you know, less than two weeks is a, is a short amount of time to get people to change their mind. Claire Pacquin. I think the question would be, do French people see their own parliamentary elections in the same way as they saw the European elections? Do they feel that their vote will be used in the same way? Is it OK to vote for those who voted for Jordan Bardella in the European elections, but do they really want the 28-year-old as their prime minister? I think that's the question, and, mm -hmm. and things are going to move fast in the next right. few weeks. We'll, we'll find out soon. Plenty to happen. Claire Pacquelin, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank as well uh, Victor Goury, uh, Lafont, Gabriel Latanzion, Laurent Cohen-Tanugui. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.